Dharma people, today we are talking about the acceptance criteria. How do you break it up? How do you know what is the right level of detail? How should it be structured? And all that good stuff. So that's what we're talking about today. Stay with me. about the Agile um, methodology and I'm doing a series on the Agile business analyst and I've done a few videos already I've done a video on sprint planning which is here I've also done videos on the sprint retrospective which is a great way for you to uh, learn about how to respond how to give feedback um, on what happened in the sprint before you can see that video here also, I've done a video on um, the daily stand-up and why the business analyst should be a part of that and the benefit of being involved in the daily stand-up, and that video is here. So I'm doing this series on the Agile business analyst because I've heard a lot of chatter about, you know, there's no need for a BA on the Agile team and Modern Agile does not have a BA role. They only have the product owner role and all that stuff. So I just want to clarify from my perspective and that many companies agree with me because more and more companies are finding out the value of having a business analyst on the team. Because you know what? A lot of times when we don't have a business analyst, you find yourself doing a lot of rework. You find there's a lot of time to push a feature or a, you know, an update or something and it does not meet the need. So you have to go and redo things. Not to say it will happen when a PA is on, on the team, but the business analyst role is specifically for that, that we do all of the upfront analysis, we talk to the stakeholders, we try to understand what it is that the business needs are, so that when we write the acceptance criteria, we get into the team, we can help to manage that process so that when we get to the end, what we deliver should match the need. Okay, not to say that we don't make mistakes and we don't have that happen on a team that has a BA, but it's just more, it's, it's less likely. Because the product owner is deep in the weeds too, right? The product owner is doing a lot of management of the actual um, development process and keeping abreast of everything. Um, I don't know if the same skill is being applied to make sure that we get all of the upfront analysis done. The BA role and the PO role is not the same. It, there is some overlap, but it's not the same. We have the skill set as BAs to bring a lot of value to the Agile team. So when people say, oh, we don't need a BA on the Agile team, I'm like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You'll find out, <laughs> right? You That's why your, your team is like that. That's why you're having all these issues. You'll find out. But yeah, so that's just what I'm saying. I'm not trying to, you know, make the BA sound like they're all important or whatever, but it's just, we have the skill set and the team needs it, you know? So that's, that's the point of that. So this video is gonna talk about the acceptance criteria. And this is one of the things that people struggle with a lot. And just to let you know that there is no exact science to this thing. There is no exact science. So when other people who have been doing it for a long time look at your acceptance criteria and make it look like you don't know what you're doing, you can look back at them and say, well, what you're doing isn't the rule either. Like, there is no standard to say this is exactly how you write an acceptance criteria because every feature is different. Every project is different, every company is different, everything you're doing is different. So don't think anybody has the, the rights on what an acceptance criteria should or should not be. What we do know is that to write a user story, and I have a video on user stories right here, so go watch that, um, is that you normally start off with the user in mind. And the reason why this has been so successful is because before Agile, in waterfall and other methodologies, people were just building things, building things because it was great, a great idea, it looked good, it fit, it fit this feature, and they built it. But then nobody used it. So they realized that you need to build things for the user. So the user has to be forefront in your mind at all times, thinking about how is the user benefiting from what I'm doing. 
And so that's the whole point of the user story, to keep the user at the center focus of what you're writing. So you start off a user story by saying, as a type of user, I want to do this feature so that I can have this benefit. So you always have to look why, so that what, so that they can have the benefit. And that forces you to think through the benefits of all the features that you make for the end user. Um, and it could be even an admin user, it could be a system user, it could be whatever the user type is, which is, that takes the place of what actors were on the waterfall side. So the actor on the waterfall side, we use that user um, on the Scrum Agile side, that's the, the user or user type. So once you've written that out and you've thought through how the user is benefiting, then you have your acceptance criteria. And the acceptance criteria needs to be achievable and testable. You can demonstrate it at the end of the sprint. So you need to be able to um, test it. So the, the real point of the acceptance criteria is to define what makes the user story fulfilled. If it meets this, 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 and this, it's done. It's like a definition of done, right? So the, the user story is very important and the acceptance criteria even more so because the acceptance criteria will be what they will actually build. It will be what QA will be testing against and it will be used as your documentation going forward. So everything in your acceptance criteria has to be correct because that's what they're going to build. And when you watch the video on the sprint planning, the, the developers are not going to accept a story until they understand each of those acceptance criteria and agreed each of those acceptance criteria. So it's very, 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 very important. Now, how do you know how to break up a story, right? Now, this is this is a big thing because you could have a big feature, but it all seems related. So you want to put it all in the same user story and have this long acceptance criteria. Sometimes you can get away with that. Sometimes you can't, right? So you have to know when it's enough for you know one thing to get done part of the point is that people like to feel like they have accomplished something they can check a box okay i did this i did this i did this if you give a developer a very very long story it feels like he's working on it for a long time and his co-workers they have done two three stories he's still on the same story it makes him feel like like he's not accomplishing anything and it's not really about the emotions about it but it's just that if you can break it up into bite-sized chunks People can just do this first and then do that, do that. It's easier for people to think through a smaller subset of acceptance criteria than a long one, you know? And if there's, if longer it is, the more inter interdependencies you could have for other stories. So you find that this other developer can't start because he's waiting on you to finish this story that impacts that story. So if you can make them, you know, valuable, but as short as possible, that kind of helps to move through the different stories um, quicker. So it's okay to have many stories, um, not try to put everything in one big story. That being said, you don't want the story to be too short and then it's like, it's not even worth any estimation points. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's a dance. <laughs> it's a dance. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Sometimes you can see a story that's like this, sometimes a story like this, and you're like, what, why, did, why was it so long and it's so short? It's just a feature, you know, you have to apply your knowledge as the BA, or even if it's, it's the PO writing this, you have to apply your knowledge of the whole system, the whole scenario, how the developers work, how your team works, to know what is the right level of detail that you should put in your acceptance criteria. There's no other science that I can tell you about this. Um, so that's important. Now, I like to bullet point my acceptance criteria because so let me just say this before I say that. <laughs> so the acceptance criteria sometimes is a scenario, right? Because you want to frame the reader as to what is happening when this story is being uh, achieved, right? So when I log in and I select um, accounts, I want to see all of my account information. So things like that. So you kind of frame what the user is doing at the time when this acceptance criteria comes into play. So sometimes people write that as a paragraph just to make it flow easy, like a story, because it really is a user story. But the thing is, when there's a problem in some part of the paragraph, it's hard to pinpoint it. And that's the reason why I suggest that you have a numbered list of your acceptance criteria. That way, if there's a problem with number four, we can go straight to number four, change that, and update. 
Um, the other thing too is I always like to start off with where the user is. So the first acceptance criteria number one would be where the user logs in and they see the option to select account, you know, they click account and something else happens and I can put those as separate acceptance criteria. But you have to frame what's going on. And you normally try to give it into a scenario so you can say, given that I'm already logged in or when I log in or um, after the user clicks OK on the, you know, the confirmation page, you know, something like that. So you want to explain what the user is doing up front so that you know this this takes the place of what we would call the preconditions on the waterfall side on the user service side is, is how you frame the acceptance criteria the other thing too is you not you need to have your acceptance criteria written before development starts obviously right because you have to have it written before sprint grooming which i talked about in that video i showed you on sprint planning and then after sprint grooming they go into sprint planning and that's when the developers will look at every single acceptance criteria and they have to agree to every single acceptance criteria before they actually story point the story and make it be a part of the sprint. So it has to be written and vetted before. Now, when you're writing your acceptance criteria, in addition to putting the scenarios in there, always make sure that you, um, you account for validation. So sometimes people just write the story for functionality, but they don't say, okay, if this doesn't go right, then what happens? You need to always remember the validation steps and the errors that can happen. For example, the person doesn't have permission to do what you want them to do, or there is some data validation you need to make on certain fields, and how does that show? You don't have to put the data validation inside of the story, but you have to like refer to it to say, okay, um, um, you could say, you know, error handling handled in story, blah, blah, blah. And then it depends on what tool you're using, you could have that linked. Because sometimes in Jira, you can link a story that's related to the one you're writing so that you can see all the stories that are related. If it's a small error handling, like for example, when they click delete, you want to show a confirmation message, that doesn't have to be its own story. That can be a part of the acceptance criteria. So that's what I'm saying. Like You have to know when to break it out into its own story and when to just include it. So obviously you can break it out, right? So if it's like one would be the functionality and then one A is what happens if it's an error, one B if the user accepts it, one C if the user does not accept. So like that. So it depends on how small it is. If there's a lot of information you gotta put in the validation, then you make a separate story and you link that story to the one you're writing. So again, just have to use analysis skills, right? That's how you do it. The other thing too that I like to do is that even though you've done your best, you tried your best to capture everything in your acceptance criteria, when the developer gets in there, they might come up with some scenario that you did not think about. And so they're in development already, but we're agile, we can change. So if they, they bring something to your attention, you can go in and change the acceptance criteria to account for this new information that you just got. But what I like to do is I like to make a note that this is a change. So I would put in bracket change and I put the date to say that this is a, a like an a, amendment to what we had before. And I put it in a different color so that it can bring attention to say, okay, we changed something so that I can, you know, I can have that in the forefront whenever I look at that story. That's just a little tip that I use. Um, the other thing about the acceptance criteria is that it depends on how the feature is going or what you're working on, how your project is. Because if you have a UX person, then when you first come up with a solution, you would have had some wireframes or some mockups. You'd have shown that to the different teams to get their feedback and make sure they understand and they agree. You got that buy-in. Now you have this mockup as your starting point for your user story. And so you could write your acceptance criteria based on a different mockup. So you could say, okay, I have a mockup mock of the screen. It has a filter button, it has an export button, it has a sort button, it has a table. And so you could write a user story just for creating that screen. And then each of these buttons will have their own use, user story and acceptance criteria for how they actually function. And that could be how you break up your, um, your user stories and your acceptance criteria. Now that doesn't always work because you could have one screen with so many options and menu buttons and all kinds of stuff. So you can't just always break it up by that. You might have one button that does so much things that you have to break that one up, you know, 
or it might be so simple that it included in something else. So it's a, it's again, you have to apply your own skills to this. But that could be one way that you break up your user stories by the different screens, the different buttons and functionality that's available on that screen. So those are some tips for doing the user story and acceptance criteria. I'm actually going to go into an example and show you what I would do if I was writing a user story for this example. Check it out. So I'm jumping into my favorite little tool here called Target Process. It's my favorite alternative to Jira, but I am a little rusty in it because I haven't been using it for a while and I just don't remember some of the things. <laughs> but for this exercise, I am going to use it just to show you how I write a acceptance criteria. So let's start off, let me uh, find my items here. Okay, so let's start off assuming that you work at a bank and you are the business analyst or the product owner on the bank and you want to include a feature in your mobile app to do funds transfer. So you want to allow mobile app users to transfer funds from one account to the next. This is something very simple, very easy to follow and you should probably already know how this works already. So you're tasked with that feature and then you're asked to, you know, make sure that it gets developed. So you go ahead and you say you're gonna to have to write your acceptance criteria and your user story. So here I have, I actually haven't created an epic or anything. I just created a user story for this. Let's say this is a user story. And I went ahead and I put in some data in here already, some, you know, how I would tackle this problem. So I've started out by saying what the actual user story is. And remember the format we just talked about as a type of user, I want to do this feature so that I can have this benefit. So I go and I say, as a mobile app user, I want to transfer funds from the mobile app so that I can have funds from one account available in another account, right? So that's very straightforward and to the point, but you, you can see that you have capture what the benefit is to the user just from that one sentence. But my acceptance criteria is here and I start off, like I said before, I want to set the scenario. So when the user logs into their mobile app and sees their list of accounts, they will also see an option to make a transfer. Now, you do not always have to start from the beginning and you don't always have to start. When I say beginning, I mean, you don't have to start from everything possible from that feature. For example, in this case, when they log in, they want to see the list of accounts. You have to assume that there was already a story from the first time the mobile app was launched that would handle what happens when you log in if you can see your accounts. Because sometimes the banks won't show you accounts that are closed. They won't show you accounts that have some kind of you know, regulatory problem or stuff like that. So they might not show you all of the accounts based on some criteria. So you don't have to go back and rehash all of that in the first setup of the scenario, right? That's why I have this note up here to say, assuming that you've already handled what accounts can be shown when the user logs in. And then my next sentence, as you notice that I'm going very straightforward, like it's just one liners, one sentence right, for each thing. Now, the second thing I have is when the user clicks the option to make a transfer, they will see a transfer account screen with options to pick the source, the destination, and the amount. This is really to say to the developer that there is another screen that you'll have to show when they click the button to say make a transfer. And these are the fields that will be on there. I mean, you could write this a different way. You could bullet point it and say, okay, they will see source, destination, amount, you know, transfer button, as one accept, you know, one liner in the acceptance criteria, but I broke it into two because the third one says the, the transfer account screen will show a transfer button, but it will not be enabled until the required fields are filled in. So I could have said that source, destination, and amount are also required fields. I could say that, and I probably should, but I was going to deal with them individually further down. That's why I didn't really make a point at the beginning here. But you could always do that. Um, and then the user will be able to pick a source account. This field is required, so that takes care of that. An account is shown as source only if you have some 
bank rules, right? That the account is active, that the balance is greater than zero, that the type is savings or checking. And the bank would have several more rules to make you be able to transfer or not. For example, some credit unions will not let you uh, transfer more than, I don't know, five or six times in the month. So if you've already done that, then do you still show them the account if they know that, if you know they, they can't transfer or do you show an error or something like that? So there's a lot about val validation I'm going to talk about in a minute, but just the point is that there could be several rules that you don't want to call out here as a part of your acceptance criteria. So the developer knows that you can account for those things when they're building out the story. The user can enter a value in the transfer amount field. This field is required. The transfer amount entered must, enter, must meet the following criteria. Transfer amount is not more than the available balance of the source account. And then you have some validation to say, if it is, then show an error. The transfer amount does not leave the account with a zero balance because some banks don't want you to leave your account with zero balance because that will automatically close out the account and you may not intend to do that. So there's some some bank rules here that you, you'd call out as well. The user can see a destination account and this field is required. So this, this handles that all, all three actually required. So again, I could have put it up here, but that's just you know an example. An account is shown as a destination account only if the account is active and the account is the same currency as the source account. So, and there could be more. I mean, I'm just calling out two obvious things here. When the user successfully chooses the source and destination account and the transfer amount, user must see the transfer button become active. So once you fill in your values, then you see the button, you know, become brighter or active or whatever, however you use to show an active uh, button. When the user clicks the transfer button, the system must make the transfer and display a confirmation message. And that confirmation message could be something that you've already handled in another story to say, how does a confirmation look? To say, yes, it's successful or yes or no, it wasn't successful. And then the user, once it's confirmed, the user is given an, op an option to save the message to their phone gallery. So this whole confirmation message, this whole required fields, these, these bank rules, there could be a whole lot more in terms of error handling that will need to happen here because you might, you know, part of it is you may already have a framework to handle um, design elements. So this, you probably know already, how do you show, you know, missing required fields? You put a red box around the field and you put the word field is required below it. Do you pop up and say something? So you already, we're assuming that there is a framework that's out there that, the developers already know of and that there's a design of how we show errors consistently throughout the application. So that's why I didn't go into too much detail as to what it should look like because you're assuming that they already have that as a global feature. Um, but then for the functionality pieces where, you know, there could be many more rules that the bank has for showing accounts, many more rules for transferring accounts and, um, many more data validation rules that you have to handle. So what I would do, I wouldn't try to cram all of that into this story. Although I do have places here where I'm handling like, you know, if, if the amount is more than the available balance then show an error. I mean, you could argue that that could go into your error handling as well. And that might be true, but I feel like it's such a small thing. I could just put it in here, but for the bigger things that take much more in-depth explanation that I'll put that in a separate story. So I have it here. I don't think I'd want that story to be much longer than this. I have nine bullet points here. And then I've attached a screenshot I got off the web <laughs> for what it could look like. Um, so that there's a visual to go with the, the acceptance criteria. But of course, for example, if I was gonna use this exact screen, which is again, something I just pulled off the web, then I'll try to make the terms match. So here you have from account to account. In my acceptance criteria, I have source and destination. So I would change it to be the same. So if, if it's from or to, I use from or to throughout, right? So things like that, you wanna be conscious of. And then I would have created a separate story for the error handling because I don't wanna make this story too long. And then what I would do is I would um, show that there's a dependency. So this error handling story would control or would cover all the acceptance criteria for all the bank rules that 
could could go awry from that functionality and all the situations and scenarios that can happen and how the app needs to handle that and that would be a dependency on the other story because the developer who's working on the error handling can't do the error handling until the first developer does the actual functionality right so that's why that's another way that you can break up your stories because you know that this one has to finish before that one so you can make them into two separate stories that's an example guys of how i would tackle um a problem like this not to say this is perfect by any means there are some things here just looking at it again i'm like oh i could have done this i could have done that so it's good to write your stories and have enough time to come back and review it later to make sure you're covered everything and that it's clear and you can read it over to make sure that you know you're using the right language um but this is typically how you want to do it i like having it bullet point i like having it indented so you can see things cl clearly and easily so that somebody who's looking through it, scanning through it, can understand it. Um, even this story is a little bit long, but I mean, I wouldn't want to go any longer than this. And definitely want to put the associated screenshot or any mockups, diagrams, whatever you have into the story so that people can make more quick association. And also to name it properly so that when you're scanning through it in the Kanban board, it makes sense. So I name it what it is doing. So things like that. Okay guys, so that was the acceptance criteria and how to write them. I hope this was useful for you. I hope you learned something and uh, please leave a comment below if you have any other topics you'd like me to make a video on. And uh, if you have not yet subscribed, guys, just click the subscribe button and the notification to get notified whenever I post a new video. I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful day and I will see you next time. This is Carolise.